Wow, wow, wow. Es un placer de estar aquí con ustedes esta noche. Esta es una iglesia muy especial, una, un lugar de transformación, un lugar para los milagros del Jesucristo. Por el poder de la sangre de Jesús. <risa> Tu pastor es mi hermano de otra madre. <laughs> wow. What a blessing it is to be here with you tonight. I'm incredibly, incredibly honored. I love the spirit of your pastor. I love his passion. I love his conviction. I love his standard to holding the truth, the uncompromised unadulterated truth but I love his love for God and his love for people reaching out and serving them and in such a wonderful way and the worship has been so excellent tonight that we would be blessed if we went home right now we really would my God my God you, I mean this place is so awesome that when you die and go to heaven you're going to want to ask God for a pass to come out on the weekend so you can have worship here on the weekend I mean this this is an awesome place this is something really special I hope that you can feel the power of God in this place and uh, I, I'm thankful for it you know that the reason the reason that there are more flowers at a cemetery than there are at someone's desk is because regret is stronger than gratitude But let, not, let that not be said of the people of God. We're a grateful people. Anybody grateful that God has changed your life? That he's made a difference on the inside of you? Are you grateful that God brought you to this place? Are you grateful that he saved you, that he redeemed you, that he washed you in his own blood? Are you grateful that God would use you in spite of you? Are you grateful? It's so good to see grateful people tonight. It's so good, it's so good, it's so good. Well, take your seat if you can. Take your seat if we can. We're going to, we're going to go for a ride. Uh, there are so many things that are buzzing, bouncing around in my spirit. I feel like a, a mosquito in a nudist colony. But I believe that Jesus is going to do something amazing. I'm so grateful for the groundwork that was laid last night. And let me just remind you that God still honors sacrifice. He still loves sacrifice. He loves it when we turn our plate down and we'll seek his face. God loves it. God loves it. He absolutely loves it. And I'm, I'm just glad about what he's doing in the midst of his precious, precious people. He, he's such an awesome, awesome God. And I pray that you will allow God to just use you as an instrument in his hand every place that you go in a way that you will take the same passion with which you served sin and now serve God with that same passion. I mean, what a, what a difference that that makes. And you know, if I had not talked to God before he, I came here, I have no authority to speak for him. A message needs a pulpit but an anointing requires an altar. And I'm so grateful to God for the power of an altar to be able to get before Jesus and say, God, I die to myself and I acknowledge the perfect sacrifice, the inestimable sacrifice, the incalculable sacrifice that was paid through Jesus Christ on the cross for me. And I pray that you get something tonight that will bless you, whether you're here in the sanctuary, in an overflow room, whether you're watching online, that God knows you, he sees you. God sees you. Even when nobody else sees you, God sees you. He's got his eye on you. He's got his eye on you. And I'm grateful, I'm grateful, I'm grateful. There's a divine impartation that comes from God and These are days that require us not to just be ordinary, but to be radical. 
Sweet, kind people that obey all the rules all the time never change the world. The ones who are going to change the world are those that are going to have radical faith. Radical faith causes you to pray radical prayers. You don't even have the guts to pray radical prayers unless you've got radical faith. I'm in a kind of a prayer that Joshua prayed and the sun stood still so he could fight and be able to see what he was doing. And you can't really fight when you can't see your enemy. That's what made COVID so challenging. It's we've been fighting an invisible enemy. But may the people of God, may we be so infected with the Holy Ghost that everybody that we open our mouth to, that everybody that we speak to would catch what we have. May they catch it. May, may, may it be as though we have sneezed on them and they catch something that is divine and it begins to spread from heart to heart and breast to breast all over the world. Isn't it amazing that something could rise up in one church and you'd be surprised how connected the world is and you can sneeze Jesus on somebody through a tweet, through a text message, through a telephone call, through bumping into somebody at a Walmart or Target and you can be so infected with the Holy Ghost that your very presence becomes infectious to others and they catch your zeal, that they catch your faith, that they catch your diligence, that they catch that thing that is radical. And may I remind you of this, the word radical is not something that's just wild. The word radical actually means rooted. Like a tree that gets rooted you know the redwoods in California here? It's because their roots go down, not so deep, but they go out to a network of those others that are in close proximity. It is in the root system that they have radical height. You never know how high you can go when you're radically rooted in God, rooted in truth, rooted in the word, rooted in scripture. There's a power in it. It produces in you radical faith to pray radical prayers. Radical prayers. When is the last time you prayed a radical prayer? Radical faith produces radical prayers. Radical prayers. There were people in scripture that prayed radical prayers when women were barren and they prayed a radical prayer and all of a sudden they had a child. When is the last time that there was something barren in your spirit and you prayed something radical saying, God, let me birth something that is from you. Because whatever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. It's time now to realize that there's something on the inside of you that you're carrying, that you're carrying that is radical. Radical faith produces radical prayers. And radical prayers, if you're gonna get them answered, it's because you must have radical obedience. You can't just have radical faith and pray a radical prayer and then live any kind of way that you want to live. It requires radical obedience. Abraham had radical obedience and God gave him something that blew his mind. You see, radical faith gives you the boldness to pray radical prayers, but it has to be undergirded with radical obedience radical obedience and when you do the radical obedience it produces radical blessings can God ever trust you with a blessing that will be radical in your life can he trust you with what will be radical in your life well I want to share a couple of scriptures with you one from Romans chapter 1 and verse 1 in the English Standard Version this is the Apostle Paul writing to the church at Rome and he says, for I long to see you that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. Impart. Isn't it amazing that impartation can bring gifts into your life that will actually strengthen you? Uh, it, just through an impartation, just an impartation. Paul said, I long to see you so that I might impart this thing to you. I'm glad that you're here so that I can see you. 
to be able to impart something to you. There have been times that I've been preaching various places in the world and I wasn't there long enough to give them everything and I had to close my eyes and said, God, impart it into them. You give them what I couldn't give them. Impart it to them supernaturally. Impart it to them divinely. And Paul here is saying that I long to see you so that I, I can impart some spiritual gift to you that it will strengthen you. And then he said in, in, uh, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 4 in verse 14, the apostle Paul writing to young Timothy, he says, do not neglect the gift that is in you, which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of the hands of the eldership. Now here again is a gift that came through impartation. And I hope that you don't think that you can come through these days now that you're focusing on impartation and wind up empty-handed. Empty-handed or empty-hearted or empty-headed. I think that God has something for each dimension of you. And so he says, don't neglect. Don't, if once you get a gift by impartation, don't sit on it. Because here's the deal. A gift is not a gift until it is given. A song is not a song until you sing it. A bell is not a bell until you ring it. Life is not life until you live it. Uh, that you've got to do something with it. I mean, if nobody gave it to you, is it really a gift? A gift is only a gift when it is given. It cannot serve its purpose for which it was created or prepared. And he says, the gift... He says, don't, don't, don't let it sit there, use it. The gift that was imparted to you by prophecy and the laying on of the hands of the eldership, the presbytery. Uh, there's a gift, there's something that is imparted to you when you come in contact with people that know God that will come. And so I, I, I just want to talk about these three words with you tonight. Catch, catch, carry, carry, and then convey. Those three words, catch, carry, convey. Catch, carry, convey. Catch, carry, convey. It's, it's what a basketball player does. He, he catches the ball and then he carries the ball and then he conveys it to the basket. It's what a football player does. He, he catches the ball, then he carries the ball, then he conveys it across the goal line. It's, it's a matter of catching, carrying, and conveying. Catching, carrying, and conveying. Catching, carrying, and conveying. The impartation that God has for you, you have to catch it. You have to catch it. You, you catch it. He says, the spiritual gift that was given to you, you catch it. It's as though it is dropped from heaven. You have to catch the gift. You catch it. You, 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 you get a hold of it. You catch revelation. You catch the Holy Ghost. You catch an anointing. Just like you can catch a cold, you can catch a blessing. You can catch an attitude. Uh, you, you, you can catch it, you catch it, you catch it, you catch it. What happens with a woman when she catches a seed from a man and she carries it nine months and then she conveys the baby to the family. It's a matter of catching, carrying, and conveying. Catch, carry, convey. Catch, carry, and convey. What's in, not in your wallet, what's in your hand? What's in your heart? What's in your heart? What have you caught from God? Remember Abraham at 75 years old. Now if God could start a, a man over and give him a makeover at 75, can't you do it at 45? Can't you do it at 27? Can't you do it at 53? Can't you do it at 62? I mean, if God could take a man 75 years old and bring him out of his tent, out of man-made structures, and said, Abraham, 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 I want you to look up. Look up. Don't look around. Doubt looks around. Regret looks back. But my faith looks up. And Abraham, 75 years old, lifts his eyes up toward heaven. And he begins to look up until he catches a vision of estrellas, stars. He gets a vision of stars and God says, listen, Abraham, I want you to count what you see. Can you imagine what it's like to go out 
and look up in the sky at nighttime and God tells you to count the stars and then said, so shall your seed be. This is what your offspring, your future offspring is going to be this. I want you to get a glimpse of it. Catch the vision, Abraham. Catch it, catch it, catch it. If you don't catch the vision, you can't write it. You can't write a thought that you can't remember. Catch it, catch it, catch it, catch it. The problem is not that we, we don't forget, we never got. Once you get it, if you ever get something from God, you don't forget it. You cannot unsee revelation. Once you see it and it changes you, you cannot get back into your previous condition. Revelation stretches you. I came to stretch somebody tonight. And once you're stretched, you can never get back into your original size again. It's amazing. So God tells Abraham, Abraham, get out of your tent and I want you to look up. Look up. Scientists tell us, now I'm really good with numbers. I worked for 15 years as an accountant. I'm really good with numbers. And uh, scientists tell us that there are 10 sextillion stars in the heavens. 10 sextillion. Now, that's a lot of stars. That's a thousand to the seventh power. That's a one followed by 21 zeros. Let me just give you a concept of how big this number is. There are 10 sextillion stars is what scientists tell us in the heavens. A thousand million, you know what a million is. A thousand million is a billion. A thousand billion is a trillion. A thousand trillion is a quadrillion. A thousand quadrillion is a quintillion. A thousand quintillion is a sextillion. There are 10 sextillion stars in the heavens. And God wakes Abraham up and says, get out and look up. And he's looking and there are 10 sextillion stars and he's trying to believe God for one son. Not a thousand, not 10,000. One son. And here is the implicit question. After looking up at something so vast and multitudinous and incalculable, it is to say, do you see what he put here? And he says, put a picture of one of your grandchildren on the face of each of these stars. So shall your seed be. And he's asking him, in other words, is anything too hard for the Lord? Are you believing God for one business? Just for one book? Just for one record deal? Are you, I mean, just, it, you just want one good account? Look up, look up, look up. I'm telling you, it's time to be stretched with radical faith because God wants to show you more than you have ever seen all of the days of your life because there is a multitudinous host in the heavens. God never deals with a shortage. He's never run out. And he just says, look up, look up, look up. The only reason that he told him to look up because a good look up is a good hookup. You always need a good hookup. There's something for everybody. It doesn't matter whether you're in your tender teens, your teachable 20s, your tireless 30s, your forcible 40s, your fearful 50s, your seasoned 60s, your settled 70s, your aching 80s, your nebulous 90s, or your pernicious 100s. Wherever you are, there's something that God can drop into your spirit and open your eyes to and you can catch it and carry it. And let me just tell you this, when you have caught something from God, it decreases your tolerance for foolishness. How many mothers are in the house tonight? If you're a mother, you're a mother. That means you've carried a baby. You caught a seed. And while women are carrying the seed, many women go through a situation while they're pregnant 
where they become quite sensitive to smells. Sometimes they can't even stand the daddy's breath anymore. <laughs> Things that you could tolerate before you got pregnant, but now that you're carrying something, it makes you sensitive to odors. And anything that is malodorous or odiferous, you don't want to fool with that. And so when you're carrying something, it decreases your tolerance for foolishness because you're working on something. You show what you're waiting on by showing what you're working on. And there's some things that's changing on the inside of you. Uh, you're, if when you carry a baby long enough, your, your feet get larger. Your blood volume increases. The twin towers become better endowed. It's amazing when you're carrying things, what happens when, after you've caught it, it is a manifestation. And, and listen, here's, 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 here's one of the things that I really want you to get. Whenever you catch something and you're carrying it, you stop bleeding out every month. You don't get offended as easily when you're carrying something. When you're working on something, when you realize I've got something growing in me and this is bigger than anybody's mouth wagging against me because your baby is still growing on the inside. It doesn't matter when somebody begins to talk to you and you feel an elbow or a knee go across your stomach because you're working on something. You're carrying something on the inside of you. Your issue with your blood has already stopped because you're carrying something now. It is amazing that the blood rushes to that area and begins to cause development and nutrition for what you're carrying on the inside. It's amazing, it's amazing. But you catch it, you catch it, you catch it, and you carry it. And I've watched too many people miscarry and abort what they had caught from God out of frustration. Frustration comes from a Latin word, frustrare, and it literally means to deceive. Every time that you start feeling or sensing frustration, I want you to hear what the Holy Spirit is saying to you. Because every time when you start sensing frustration when you're carrying something born of God, it is a demonic attempt to, to deceive you into thinking that what God has said is not going to come to pass. Now remember, Abraham caught this vision but he had to carry the vision for 25 years before he got the manifestation. 25 years. Because oftentimes the real work of the Holy Spirit does not come overnight, it comes over time. Not all miracles are instantaneous. There are progressive works of miracles that happen by the power of the Holy Ghost that come in your daily diligence. It is not that victory comes in a day, victory comes daily. Victory doesn't come in a day, victory comes daily. Victory doesn't come in a day, victory comes daily. Every day I rise up and I begin to say, Este es el día en que el Señor actuó. Ricosigémenos y alegrémenos en él. Because victory comes every day, every day. I have to find my place of victory to be able to ward off every demonic thought that has tried to come against me. And there are frustrations that will arise. So I have to focus myself back to what he told me. The word focus comes from an old word. And it literally means fireplace. Isn't that amazing? The word focus means fireplace, like looking at a fireplace, it, our eyes become riveted to the place where the fire is. Riveted to the place where the fire is because we're in a fireplace. It's amazing that whenever you find people who have lost their fire, they have lost their focus. Because the word focus means fireplace. You don't grow cold because you get old. You grow cold because you lose your focus. You know what I've discovered? People don't give up because they get tired, they give up because they become discouraged. I've never found people that have a vision who get tired with the vision and quit because they got tired. They only quit because they get discouraged. And the discouragement is because their focus was broken. 
because they were deceived, frustrare, through the frustration. It deceived them into thinking that it has taken too long to get here to me. It's obviously not coming. And because they were deceived, they stopped believing for it. They stopped praying toward that. They stopped giving toward it. And then they watched what they had been carrying become miscarried. It's amazing that he has called you to focus on something. If you've lost your fire with anything, go back to your first love. That's why you write the vision and read it. Write the vision and read it. Write the vision and read it because God is going to put you on a mission. Uh, God is a God of intentionality. He saved you on purpose, with purpose, and for purpose. Go back to the purpose. Keep the main thing, the main thing. You go back and do what Jesus said. You love God, you worship God, you love people, you serve people. If you love me, feed my sheep. Jesus will call you to do something. If you love me, feed my sheep. I know you love God. He said, if you love me, feed my sheep. There must be a vertical relationship with God and then there's a horizontal relationship that says go out and take this to people that are hurting. Look up Abraham, can you catch anything from me? And if you can catch it, if you can catch it, if you can catch it, if you can catch it and carry it for some years because most people think that they're ready before they're ready. And if you can just sit with it and have the patience, let patience have her perfect work. Patience will expose things to you that you will know by no other means because patience is a secret weapon that forces deception to reveal itself. And then people allow themselves to become distract, distracted, but distraction is the destruction of your dream in slow motion. And if you'll ever take your time and say, God, don't let me miscarry what you've entrusted into my stewardship. I know that I caught this vision from you because in front of every prophetic promise, there will be a persistent problem. If God is bringing people, when he's bringing them out of bondage in Egypt, whatever their bondage is, drug addiction, pornography, alcohol, whatever the addiction is, greed, Pride, depression, whatever your addiction that God is calling you out of, uh, there is a promised land called freedom, called call the will of God for your life, called purpose. It's, it, there's a land there, but in front of every prophetic promise, there is always a persistent problem. There's a red sea staring that says, come on, come on across me and I'll drown you. I'm gonna put you on hold. And then you come to a place, and this, the only reason that this is so is so that God can write himself into the script of your life. Because God will never call you to do something that you can do without him. And this is what ought to be your prayer. I pray this prayer frequently. Empower me, O oh Lord, to become everything that I shall have wished I had become when I stand before you. And you ought to attempt something so great for God that it is doomed to fail except God be in it. When is the last time you prayed a radical prayer? What have you caught from God? When you're in the atmosphere of the presence of God, in his presence there is fullness of joy. At his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. When you get in the presence of God, you should never leave empty. I'm amazed at some people that come into services that are so pregnant with the transformational power of God and leave in their chains. It's amazing how somebody can be incredibly blessed and then somebody sitting next to them, sitting there looking at their watch and trying to check stuff on social media. It's amazing that you catch something from God. God has given you something to catch and he trusts you as a steward to carry the vision. It's never yours. It always belongs to him. Keep Jesus as the center of it. Keep Jesus as the center of it. Keep Jesus as the center of it. 
and you never have to question whether you're going to serve God or man. Listen, my daddy was a multimillionaire. I didn't get into ministry for money. I didn't get into ministry for the income. I got in ministry for the outcome. And I realized because I watched my dad as a multimillionaire be in love with God and lead his family as a strong man in prayer and into the things of God. My daddy was radical. He would hire people and make them come to our church. It might have been illegal, but my daddy did it. Radical, radical, radical. I believe that I am blessed today because my daddy was not a minister. He was a businessman. He called himself a minister of finance. And he was a deacon in the local church supporting and lifting up the hands of our pastor. I am convinced today that I am blessed. God's blessings, his irrevocable blessings are on my life today because of seeds that my daddy sowed into my life. But it demonstrated powerfully to me that you don't have to choose between God and money. You only have to choose which one you're going to serve. And so I made up my mind a long time ago that God, I'm going to serve you. I'm going to serve you in the beauty of holiness. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to serve you with what you've entrusted into my stewardship. And so I, as, as a young teenager, you know, I, I fell in love with him because Jesus said that he comes in the volume of the book. Around Luke chapter 23, the Bible says, beginning at Moses, he began to expound to them himself in the scriptures. He told his disciples because these folks had been reading the scriptures for years and didn't know that all of it was prophetically pointing to him. And the whole book is about Jesus. The spirit of prophecy is a testimony of Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's about Jesus. It's not about an elephant nor a donkey. It's about the Lamb of God that was slain from the foundation of the world. It is about Jesus. It's about Jesus. And I fell in love with him. I, I, I wanted to, to, to read him and to be able to see and understand that this, this thing was about Jesus. It wasn't about the prophets. The prophets were signs pointing to Jesus. Everything that happened, it was a demonstration. It was all about Jesus. I discovered, you know, in Genesis, uh, he's the seed of the woman. In Exodus, he's a Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's our high priest. In Numbers, he's a pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. In Deuteronomy, he's a prophet like unto Moses. In Joshua, he's the captain of our salvation. In Judges, he's our judge and lawgiver. In Ruth, he's our kinsman redeemer. In First and Second Samuel, he's a trusted prophet. In Kings and Chronicles, he's our reigning king. In Ezra, he's a faithful scribe. In Nehemiah, he's a rebuilder of the broken down walls of human life. In Esther, he's our Mordecai. In Job, he's our day spring on high and our ever living redeemer. For I know that my redeemer liveth. In Psalms, he's the Lord, my shepherd. I shall not want who leads me beside still waters and he restores my soul. In Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, he's our wisdom. In Song of Solomon, he's the lover and the bridegroom. In Isaiah, he's the prince of peace. In Jeremiah, he's the righteous branch. In Lamentation, he's a weeping prophet. In Ezekiel, he's the wonderful four-faced man and the wheel in the middle of a wheel. In Daniel, he's the fourth man forever married. Uh, you know, he's the fourth man in the burning fiery furnace. In Hosea, he's a faithful husband forever married to the backslider. In Joel, he's a baptizer with the Holy Ghost and with fire. In Amos, he's our burden bearer. In Obadiah, he's a mighty to save. In Jonah, he's a great foreign missionary. In Micah, he's a messenger of beautiful feet. And you see, this, this Jesus, this Jesus, this Jesus that came, he came to teach us something about himself. He came to let us know that he was the one. In Habakkuk, he's God's evangelist crying, revive that works in the midst of the, of the years. In Zephaniah, he's the savior. In Haggai, he's the restorer of God's lost heritage. In Zechariah, he's a fountain opened up in the house of David for sin and uncleanness. And in Malachi, he is the son of righteousness rising with healing in his wings. Who is this king of glory? You lift up your heads, O oh, your gates, and be ye lifted up, ye everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. In Matthew, he's a messiah. In Mark, he's the wonder worker. In Luke, he's the son of man. In John, he's the son of God. In Acts, he's the Holy Ghost. In Romans, he's our justifier. In First and Second Corinthians, he's our sanctifier. In Galatians, he's the redeemer from the curse of the law. In Ephesians, he's the Christ of unsearchable riches. 
in, in Philippians, he's our God who shall supply all of our needs according to his riches and glory. In Colossians, he's the fullness of the Godhead bodily. In First and Second Thessalonians, he's our soon coming king. In First and Second Timothy, he's our mediator between God and man. In Titus, he's a faithful pastor. In Philemon, he's a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. In Hebrews, he's the blood of the everlasting covenant. In James, he's the great physician. In First and Second Peter, he's our soon coming shepherd who shall appear with the crown of unfading glory. In first, second, and third, John, he's love. In Jude, he's the Lord coming with 10,000 of his saints. And in Revelation, he's King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He's Abel's sacrifice. He's Noah's rainbow. He's Abraham's ram in the thickets. He's Isaac's well. He's Jacob's ladder. He's Judah's scepter. He's Moses' rod. He's Elijah's mantle. He's Elisha's staff. He's Gideon's fleece. He's Samuel's horn of oil. He's David's slingshot. He's Isaiah's figs. He's Hezekiah's sundial. He's Peter's shadow. He's Paul's handkerchief and apron. He's Stephen's signs and wonders. He's John's pearly white city. He is the king of glory. And that same Jesus that went up, he's coming back in like manner with an impartation, breathing on you saying, receive ye the Holy Ghost. And he says, don't sit there with the gift. Don't sit there with the impartation. He's saying, I want you to catch it and carry it and convey it. Catch it, carry it, convey it. You got to give it to somebody else. You got to spread it and it will never diminish yours. You increase through use and decrease through disuse. It is amazing. It is amazing. Uh, I have eight grandchildren. And in service, in service one week, I'm, I'm grateful because a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. I can't even measure how well I have taught my children until I watch to see how well my children teach their children. My deposit that I carry now is for my grandchildren because a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. That's why God couldn't do all that he needed to do in Abraham. He had to have an Isaac. That's why he said, look up because he's like, Abraham, what I'm starting in you, this is bigger than you. I got to get to Isaac. We have a whole lot of material in the Bible on Abraham and a whole lot on Jacob and a very little bit on Isaac because Isaac's name means laughter. He did nothing serious with his life, but he was a bridge. And God says, I need a bridge. So even if you got a crazy child, <laughs> God said, I just need a bridge. I need a bridge because watch the grandchild and stupid stuff that the child did, I'll, I'll redeem it in, this, in their seed. Because a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. So don't even get stressed out over the child. <laughs> That's the middle thing. Because God can make it up in the grandchild and redeem that and give them vision and passion and love for God. And the wisdom can be poured in and they can be undergirded with foundation and prayer and anointing. And you pray ahead of the devil and ward him off and empower them with tools and prayer and the anointing and the word and truth. And now I'm sitting there with my little granddaughter. She's there and she's a very creative child. And I gave her a piece of paper and I gave her a piece of crayon to, to do some coloring. And while she was making her beautiful picture, she pressed too hard and the crayon broke. And she began to cry. And they call me G-Daddy and so <laughs> G-Daddy tried to fix it and so I kneeled down on her level and I, I took her little two pieces of crayon and I said, you see your cousin over there? She didn't have anything to color with. I said, now you have something to share. And I said, you have nothing to share until you're broken. And G-Daddy was just dropping revelation on his granddaughter and, sh and she was still crying. 
And so I prayed a prayer. I said, Lord, show me how to make this word real to her on her level so that she gets it. Jesus found a woman caught in adultery. He stooped down on her level and said, woman, where are your accusers? Neither do I accuse you. And I'm sitting there, I, I intuitively took the broken piece of crayon and started moving it across the paper and I said these words, broken crayons, still color. Broken crayons, still color. And through her watery eyes, a smile broke out on her face and she was delighted to see that even with the broken pieces, that there was enough efficacy, enough color, enough hue in even the broken piece to finish the picture. And I came to prophesy to somebody tonight that you get an impartation that though you have been broken, though pressure broke you, depression broke you, repression broke you, though the pressure broke your mind, broke your emotions, broken crayons, still color. God was saying, you will finish the picture. Even in your brokenness, there is an anointing because this is not about you. This is through you. And God says the picture, the vision is going to live. I'm trying to get something to you so I can get it through you. This is not about you. You don't have time to sit there crying, sucking your thumbs over the mistakes of your past. Get your broken pieces because when God gives you a command, it is never about what you have lost. It's always about what you've got left. You've got enough left in you. You've got enough broken crayons in you that you will color this picture in living color. And I just want to remind you tonight that there is a picture that God has put into your spirit that you caught by revelation, that you caught in a dream of the night, a vision of the night, and that you have carried for years, months, and weeks, and days. And there has come discouragement, and there's come depression, and there's come advance, and then regression. And then you're still carrying this thing, but you've got to convey this thing until the end. You've got to be able to birth it. You're going through the birthing pains. You're in transition. It is a time where God will take that that has been working on the inside, growing on the inside, developing on the inside, and all of a sudden, you push, and in one moment, suddenly you're about to enter into a season of divine supernatural. Suddenly, suddenly you push, and all of a sudden, here comes the baby. Suddenly you reach down and pull what was a seed in the ground and you didn't see it growing but you put your hands to it and it was a carrot you put your hands to it it was an onion it was a rutabaga it was a potato it was growing underground and some of the things that you've been waiting for are growing surreptitiously underground you couldn't even see what God was working on but yet he was working on something and you got broke in the process and God is here to remind you tonight broken Crayons still color. You catch it, you carry it, convey it. You got to get what God trusted to you. Convey it to another generation. Convey it to the sick. Convey it to the hurting. Convey it to the lost. Convey it to the least. Convey it to the last. Convey it. Catch it, carry it, convey it. Catch it, carry it, convey it. Catch it, carry it, convey it. And live your dream. Color your picture in living color and watch God blow your mind and be glorified and he will do it for your good and for his glory for your good and his glory for your good and his glory in Jesus name God bless you I love you